Um, I hope you all enjoyed our morning presentations and your workshops. Did everybody have a good time so far? Good? Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you, Rich. You owed me that, Richard. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, so first, I have an announcement. We have missing telephone. So, or alternatively, we're auctioning off a telephone. <laughs> So if I'm sitting over here, and if this is your phone, it's a red iPhone, and it's Morgan's. I should have known. <laughs> I can't repeat what she said. All right, thanks so much. Um, and I'm, I'm really delighted now to be able to introduce our luncheon speaker. I'm very excited. I think she's going to be wonderful, and I think you will too. So I saw an article in the New York Times a couple of months ago, perhaps many of you also saw it, and it was a very long article um, about the, uh, about, um, the influx of national money and national organizations into state elections and into state policy debates. Um, how there are now groups that are working to both promote issues, um, bring them into states, um, and also are working on control of elections, bringing in millions and millions of dollars in national funds to create one party rule in various different states. And I thought this was a very interesting topic of conversation and one that I thought we should explore. Um, as you know, we work with at the Budget and Policy Center with comparable groups around the country and we have seen and heard at our conferences some of the impacts that these groups have been happening, have been having on elections within their states, and then also what the policy implications of those things are. So for example, we've seen in states like North Carolina and Oklahoma um, attempts to completely abolish personal income taxes and to cut, uh, to eliminate um, earned income tax credits and other types of basic tax credit programs for low income and working people. And we've seen in Oklahoma, um, some, the, the failure of those initiatives and in, in um, North Carolina, we've seen a degree of success. And I thought it was important that we take an opportunity to explore some of those issues. Um, not long after reading this article, we learned that there was a, going to be a pretty significant effort here in Pennsylvania to take on the issue of collective bargaining rights of public or potentially private sector workers. And for those of us who have watched what happened in Wisconsin several years ago, uh, recognize that this could be a large battle and one with tremendous implications for public policy here in the state and also for, for implications um, for the variety of different coalitions within that we work with that work on advancing public investments, supporting the income growth and opportunities for low and middle income people, and protecting workers' rights. And so, again, I thought that this would be a very important issue that we should look at and one that we can help to understand what that might mean uh, for them and uh, for our, our friends and, and, and colleagues in the labor community and also what changes in public policy in Pennsylvania might mean for the very concrete things that, that many of you um, work on here in Pennsylvania. So I asked around and said, who would be the best person to come and speak on this topic and who would be willing to come to Harrisburg in the middle of, uh, of our winter. And I heard from several people the same thing, um, invite Marge Baker. And so we did. Um, Marge is the Program and Policy Director for People for the American Way. She's been there for, I guess, now about uh, maybe 20, 20, yeah. 11 years, 11 years. I'm bad on my math today. Um, People for the American Way was founded about 30 years ago by Norman Lear. Many of you may remember that. And the organization was founded to protect Americans' fundamental constitutional rights, rights to speech, rights to uh, assembly, uh, and, and freedom of religion. 
and has been very active in public policy debates since then, and, and most recently has been very active around issues related to money in politics. Um, they work on a variety of different issues, on judicial elections, on voting rights, they've worked on public education, they work on LGBT equality, and they work on something else that I can't read. But very important, I know that. Um, I, and I wanted to point out two, two other, and she has an amazing history, um, two things that, that um, are of note. One is that uh, Marge worked for uh, the late Senator Paul Wellstone for a number of years. And as you know, he was really a transformational um, a figure in, in national politics and um, somebody that many of us had the opportunity to meet and certainly has helped to, to move, to advance a, a progressive agenda across the country and was really a, a visionary leader in that way. And she also used to live up the road from me when we both lived in upstate New York many years ago, um, found that we were in, the, in New York around the same time. So she is, as I am, probably more used to the snow than many people here are and, and, um, and able to drive in it, I think, much more effectively than many of the people I've seen recently on the roads. So, and I don't want to make light of this critical topic. Um, this 2014 is a very important year here in Pennsylvania. You know, there's going to be a lot of debate about important issues, and um, you know, the outcomes of our policy debates these years, this year, will have implications well into the future. So, um, let me introduce Marge Baker and let her talk to you a little about the influence of money in politics. Thank you, Marge. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sharon. What a great introduction. Well, wow. thank you so much. Um, I am really delighted to be here, and I want to also thank you for whatever you're doing to get rid of the snow on the roads. It's really great. Keep it up. Keep it up. It was a great drive up here. And I also want to say that um, you know Paul Wilson, who I um, was my most important mentor in life, I think, um, would be absolutely delighted that I'm here, and he would be absolutely delighted at the work that all of you in this room are doing um, for, for, uh, for the, the, the people of Pennsylvania. Um, and just so I just wanted to say that. It's just, it, feels, it feels really good to be here. It feels really at home. Um, so the topic I've been asked to address is the role of big money in state policy debates, and in particular, how these forces are playing out when it comes to collective bargaining rights. I think the real question, um, as Sharon alluded to, on people's minds is, um, is Wisconsin coming to Pennsylvania? And the answer, unfortunately, is that we better take this really seriously, um, because the larger forces at play make it extremely likely. What are these forces? All across the nation, we're seeing a new kind of anti-democratic dynamic that threatens to undermine any effort to address the economic inequality that plagues our nation, that threatens to undermine the hard work that everyone in this room is doing day in and day out. What I think is important to understand is that economic inequality isn't just a failure of government policy, it's a failure of our democracy. And unless we can find an answer to the fundamental political inequality, that plagues our democracy, we won't make headway in dealing with the economic challenges that face us. So let's start with the facts. Over the last 40 years, as the productivity of American workers has soared, wages for those workers has stagnated. The spoils of the booming economy driven by the hard work of Americans have largely gone into the bank accounts of a very few. Today, half of our country's wealth is held by just a few hundred people. Pennsylvania is unfortunately exemplary of these trends. In fact, Pennsylvania, according to a recent report, is among 17 states where, as the slow recovery from the Great Depression has played out, the top 1% has captured more than 100% of the overall increase in income. Think about that. The top 1% of Pennsylvanians have gotten more than 100% of the overall increase in income in the last couple of years. It's staggering. And it's not just about the growing income gap between rich and poor. It's about whether all Americans have a fair opportunity to succeed, to get ahead, to provide for their families. 
the issues that all of you in this room are wrestling with, whether it's workers' pensions, public education, fair taxes, health care, sustainable energy policies, are all about creating opportunities to address economic inequality. Now, some tell us that it is somehow unconstitutional or un-American for the government to be involved in education, in health care, um, in ensuring clean air and water. But I don't know what constitution they're reading. Promoting the common good is not just a value shared by people from all faiths and walks of life. It's an explicit goal of our constitution. Promoting the general welfare, the common good, is right here in what we, the people, committed to doing together. This is my pocket constitution. I take it everywhere, like Bobby Burke. Okay. So the effort to create equal opportunity for all, to promote the common good, is absolutely among the richest part of our constitutional tradition. Yet today, the principle is under attack. How do we get here? I believe we got here because our democracy is fundamentally broken. In a democracy truly powered by the voices of the people, a democracy premised on what I call political equality, the first priority of our elected officials would be to, to address the needs of all of their constituents and advocate for policies that serve the common good. But that's not what we have. Instead, there are forces at work in our political system that are taking the people out of democratic governance and replacing our people power with the power of money. It's a dangerous and anti-democratic cycle of dysfunction, one that we need to acknowledge if we're going to start correcting it. So the cycle of dysfunction I'm talking about starts with our elections, moves to public policy, then moves back to our elections, and on and on, unless we stop it in its tracks. So let's start with the elections. Four years ago, the Supreme Court, in the Citizens United case that I'm sure many of you have heard about, opened the floodgates for corporations and also billionaires to spend unlimited sums to influence our elections. And as a result, the wealthy interests we know took them up on this invitation with enthusiasm. Of course, the goal of spending money in elections is not just to win elections, it's to influence public policy. So in 2010, we got a powerful glimpse of what this dynamic meant. In states around the country, legislators who were catapulted into power by big corporate donors and wealthy billionaires started giving back. As you and I know, the priorities of large corporate donors are not always the same as the priorities of average working families looking for a fair shot at economic opportunity. In fact, they're often the exact opposite. So these elected officials started giving back to the moneyed interest that got them in office, right? And some of the most alarming policies we saw coming out of the 2010 were hostile attacks on workers themselves. These newly ensconced conservative legislators went after working people, from factory workers to teachers, as they sought to take away their collective bargaining rights, their rights in the job, and their ability to achieve equal opportunity for their families. And once these legislators and their funders get into power, they naturally use that power to solidify the control going forward. And that brings us back to elections. In the past four years, we've seen legislatures gerrymander their states to lock in the party's control. We've seen a wave of measures that make it harder for Americans to vote. And we've even seen efforts to rig the electoral college in order to swing presidential elections. And then, with elections rigged further against the people, we start to cycle all over again. So the result of all of this, less economic opportunity, more power for moneyed interests, less power for citizens at the polls, more money spent on elections, and the cycle continues. Scary? Yeah, but I promise not to leave you totally depressed, discouraged, and disillusioned. There are things that we in this room can do. Ultimately, united, the power of the people is a pretty awesome sight. We need to arm ourselves with information, understand what we're up against, educate our constituencies, and organize. In fact, this cycle of dysfunction in our democracy makes the work that every single one of you are doing in this room even more important. So what I want to do in the time left is to provide some more specifics on the cycle of political and economic inequality and then talk about what we can do to bring our democracy back. First, the money and politics piece. There are three parts to this story, what the courts have done, what's happened as a result at the federal, state, and would you believe it, even local level and what's in store next, so the courts. The slippery slope toward where we are now, legally at least, began in 1976 when the Supreme Court offered the proposition that spending money 
on elections is entitled to First Amendment protections. This is the money equals speech formula that's at the root of many of the problems we are seeing today. And just as an aside, ask yourself what this really means. I heard Bernie Sanders speaking to, to an event um, uh, uh, earlier this year, and he said, well, if money is speech, then if I don't have any money, does that mean I don't have any speech? And unfortunately, that's in fact how it is playing out, is that gradually, gradually, Americans, individual Americans' ability to influence elections, ability to have their voices heard, is being totally minimized. So the 1976 decision, Buckley versus Vallejo, addressed individual so-called independent spending on elections, what, what you and I could do or the average billionaire. Um, but 34 years later, the Supreme Court latched onto the money equals speech logic in a way that radically transformed our elections. In that case, the court said that the First Amendment allows corporations to spend unlimited amounts from their very deep treasuries to influence elections. And then, subsequently, a DC Circuit Court of Appeals case called Speech Now versus FEC, relying on the logic in Citizens United, gave the green light to individuals to give unlimited sums to political organizations that influence elections. And this gave birth to the era of super PACs that I think folks in this room have, have heard about and seen, the seen before their eyes. And the result, well, so the result has been an absolute explosion of outside spending on elections. At the federal level, for example, um, the Koch brothers, the billionaire Koch brothers, who I think many in this room know, know of, organized a consortium of 17 organizations and dropped more than $400 million of this outside money into the 2012 elections. It was an unprecedented operation in terms of its scope, its organization, coordination of its efforts. Different groups in this consortium were assigned different tasks. Some were assigned to deal with target young voters. Some were assigned to target Latinos. Some were assigned to do the collecting and analyzing of data. And these connected organizations used the money they raised also to mount massive, massive mobilization efforts and huge, huge amount of TV, buying of TV ads. And the money, just not to go into too much, but, you, but the, the intricacy of this is incredible. The, the money was channeled through two groups, one called Freedom Partners Chamber of Commerce and the other called TC4 Trust. And they basically served as the banker for the operation. And the money was then rooted through a third group called, it was based in Phoenix, called the Center to Protect Patient Rights, which also had a brigade of affiliates. So they kept passing this money around through these groups. It was, in, in fact, an effort to make sure that the money, much of it out of state, could end up going to the elections where it most mattered. And we did a study, People for the American Way did a study of what happened in Pennsylvania in 2012 in the House and Senate federal elections. And we found that of the, uh, of the $12 million of outside money that was spent in the, the uh, Senate and House elections in Pennsylvania in 2012, 95% came from organizations that were registered out of state. So the system of kind of putting all these pools of money together and then using all these mechanisms to transfer both shields the, the um, identity of the donors, uh, the, uh, the original donors of the money, but also permits the money to flow in a very systematic way to races where they think they can make a difference. So 95% of this state's outside money in the House and Senate races in 2012 came from out of state. So we, um, the, the, we don't, we do, some of the money is dark, um, but the source of money to the super, super PACs, we do know something about. And there's just a staggering figure, again, if you go back to this money is speech, money equals speech notion, in the presidential election in 2012, 32, the largest 32 donors to the super PACs that participated in that election raised 313 million. They spent 313 million. That was the same amount as the Obama and Romney campaigns raised from all of their 3.7 million small donors. So you've got 3.7 million little guys, right, given $200 or less, 
and 32 donors representing the amount of money that, that same group of people can be. Well, if money is speech, whose voice do you think is going to be heard in that situation? This is what we're up against, and it's getting, it's getting worse. I, you, some folks may have read about the ads that are being run now in some of the 2014 Senate elections. Kay Hagan, who's in a tight election in North Carolina, has had $8 million already spent against her, attacking her for her support, I think, for Obamacare. So it, this is just getting started. If what we saw in 2012 was the tip of the iceberg in terms of what we're going to see in 2014. But it's also happening at the state level, in state races. Um, we looked at uh, candidates in um, state level races um, are experiencing the same thing. In, in Pennsylvania in 2010, the candidates in state level races received only 7% of their funds from individuals giving $500 or less. 7%. So the rest of the money raised by candidates in Pennsylvania in 2010 elections came from people who could give $500 or more from PACs, from parties. So that's the situation that we're facing. Um, and and as, as Sharon noticed, the, the New York Times did a really good job of covering what was going on um, at, the, at the state level um, because Citizens United really freed up all this activity at all levels of government. Um, both sides did it, frankly, in, um, in post-Citizens United, but, but the fact is that the Republicans did it better and um, they were able to use their, their resources effectively and ended up flipping you know, a large number of legislatures um, and taking governorships in, in 2010. Um, to do this, they built this very, cons again, sophisticated apparatus, much like what I described at the federal level. Um, in particular, uh, Ed Gillespie, who's a Republican strategist, worked through an entity called the Republican State Leadership Council. And he put together this huge financial operation. He, they looked for the states with the laxest financial campaign finance regulations so they could use those states to, to receive money and then transfer it around through various transactions between parties and committees. Um, one interesting, uh, the New York Times article um, uh, called this a political version of the Cayman Islands banks. I mean, that's, that's, that's what this amounts to. It's very, very sophisticated and um, very hard to unpack. The Times did a really, really good job of doing that. Just one example, and it involves Pennsylvania. There's a group of Alabama donors who wanted to give money and they gave $260,000 to this operation that Gillespie had set up. The money was then moved into an account in Pennsylvania that could accept um, checks from federal PACs. And then that money sitting in the Pennsylvania account was combined with other money and then rooted through these mechanisms and ended up in Iowa, in the, in, in the coffers of the Republican Party of Iowa to support candidates in Iowa. So it's the, the it, it, this is this phenomenal network uh, to get, raise big money because they can and get it to where it can make a difference. Um, there are also increasingly money's flowing from DC based organizations to state parties and candidates. Um, the amount of money flowing from DC to state organizations between 2006 and 2010 doubled from 79 million to 139 million. So again, lots of different ways in which Citizens United unleashed these forces that we're all right now seeing the tip of the iceberg. Um, now, I, mean, I, think I mentioned this is happening not just federal level, state level, there's an, at, at the local level too. Um, you, you, um, there's an example of what happened in 2012 um, in the city council race in Richmond, California. You've got, you've got to hear this. Richmond's a small city, 100,000 people, Median household income of $44,000 a year. Um, and the Richmond City Council members themselves make $16,800 a year. That's their annual salary. Chevron decided, because it was having some disputes with the city because it had a, an explosion and there was some, some uh, toxic fumes and the city council had been a little bit hard on Chevron, Chevron decided to get into the race and spent $1.2 million dollars on three city council races, okay? Remember, these city council folks themselves make $16,800 a year. Chevron put $1.2 million into three of those elections. Outspent their opposition 10 to 1. And this is happening again, federal, state, local level, because it can and because the money is huge and the money will find its way to where whoever the large corporations of extremely wealthy, the moneyed interests think it can best be used in order to get into office the people that they want to get into office. 
And this story, unfortunately, doesn't end with just what's happening now. Unfortunately, back to the courts, the Supreme Court is about to decide yet another campaign finance case. Some people are calling it Citizens United II. Its name is McCutcheon versus FEC. And um, uh, McCutcheon is a rich, wealthy billionaire who wants to be able to give more than $125,000 a year in contributions uh, to candidates. Right now, there are federal caps on how much an individual can give to, to direct, contribute directly to campaigns. And there's an aggregate cap, and that cap is $125,000, which is, by the way, twice what the median you know, family's income is. But Mr. McCutcheon wants to be able to spend much more than that. He doesn't want any limits on what he can spend. And if the court ends up agreeing with McCutcheon, we will then be unraveling kind of the last vestige of regulation that currently exists of the money that's flowing into, into our elections. Um, a bad decision in McCutcheon could absolutely leave most individuals and communities at the mercy of powerful and totally unaccountable private forces. We're waiting any day now for that decision to come down. Um, it could be as early as Monday. It was argued back in October. Um, and it's, it's got the attention of a lot of, of, of folks in a whole range of communities who understand that their constituencies will be drastically affected. Um, what, what, if McCutcheon gets what he wants, he would be able to, he, one person would be able to spend more than $3.5 million in a single election cycle. And again, if you go back to this money of speech, think about the megaphone that gives somebody compared to somebody who can give maybe $100 to campaign, $200 to campaign. So, so the next chapter, this, that's the money and politics piece in the story. The next chap chapter of this story is, what does a government ruled by unaccountable private forces look like? So getting the candidates elected is just the beginning for this new breed of big campaign spenders. Once they take over legislatures, they use their legislative control to further entrench their power. For example, as I mentioned, through the massive redistricting to both the state and federal level that we've seen over the last several years. They've even entertained legislation to rig the next presidential election by changing how states award their electoral college votes. And Pennsylvania has kind of been ground zero of that. There's a serious effort to um, uh, allocate electoral college votes in the state by congressional district, not a winner-take-all system. And what, what, that, what that means is it totally disenfranchises um, populations in urban areas, more populated urban areas, um, and, it, and it's basically an effort to just kind of rig the elections. It also, by the way, makes Pennsylvania less of a battleground state because that you end up fighting over only a few congressional districts where there might be some issue. Uh, there's a number of folks organized to try to put this down last year. We were very involved in that effort as well. People for the American Way were successful, but there's some fear that it may come back um, during the lame duck session as, as other things might. So it's something to be on the radar screen. But it's, it's a threat, essentially. It's even a threat here because moneyed interests succeeded in getting folks elected to office here who don't necessarily have the interest of average Pennsylvanians at heart. They have other interests that they're, that they're um, indebted to um, because those are the interests that help them get elected. Um, so the other, the other thing to know about is that once elected a lot of these public officials are supported by a very powerful infrastructure. It's funded by corporations, and again, the super wealthy, um, that helps them write and pass measures that serve the interests, again, of those who got them into office. Um, I, I'm, hopefully, a number of you have heard of the American Legislative Exchange Council, ALEC. Um, meeting behind closed doors, representatives from a whole range of business interests draft and vote on model bills that the legislators then take back to their states to get enacted with the help of the corporate lobbyists who helped them write the bills and, and voted on them. So nationwide, these measures cover, I would say, probably every issue that folks in this room um, work on, opposition to minimum wage, elimination of occupational licensing for any profession, diversion of taxpayer funds to support private schools, lowering corporate taxes, a tax on environmental regulation, narrowing access to the courts, making it difficult to hold corporations accountable. Even there's a set of ALEC bills preventing local, lo preventing local paid sick leave ordinances. And the same is true right here in Pennsylvania. A 2013 Keystone Progress report found that 41 Pennsylvania legislators are members of ALEC. 
including much of the Republican leadership in both chambers. And they are promoting a similar ALEC agenda, including, again, opposition to increasing the minimum wage, scaling back child labor laws, opposition to prevailing wage laws, um, moratoria or rollbacks of environmental regulation, use of taxpayer funds to support private schools, more and more and more. So ALEC is very present here in, in Pennsylvania. Keystone Progress has done a whole lot of work kind of um, uh, covering them and what they're doing. Um, the, the other part of ALEC, though, is the, um, uh, the think tanks. There's a network of think tanks that work in close collaboration with ALEC um, as part of something called the State Policy Network. Here in Pennsylvania, it's the Commonwealth Foundation and the Allegheny Institute. Um, they're both part of this web of these um, conservative state-based think tanks called the State Policy Network. And they rely heavily, again, on funding from conservative billionaires. Both of them are, are um, funded, I think, by the SCAFE Foundation. They're also funded by the, there's something called the Donors Trust and Donors Capital Fund, which are Koch-backed um, funds, Koch Brothers-backed funds. Um, uh, Mother Jones is called the, the, the Donors Trust and Donors Capital Funds, the sort of dark money ATM of the conservative movement. So that's, these, these conservative think tanks, Commonwealth and, and Allegheny, get their money from that, um, that group of interest. And their agenda is all about, you know, it's all about school vouchers, cutting pensions, privatization. Um, it, it, both, both Commonwealth and Allegheny's uh, agenda is heavily, heavily, um, anti-worker, uh, anti, anti, -worker, anti, anti -union. going after the um, organized labor is kind of the target list for, for these think tanks. Um, and, and that's basically because they want to eliminate unions as a force for addressing the economic inequality that we were talking about at the beginning of this discussion. Um, a Commonwealth Foundation fundraising letter came to light last year, it has a project, something called a Project Goliath, which makes it clear that they intend to destroy the public sector unions in Pennsylvania, much like Scott Walker tried to do in Wisconsin. And such attacks act, go to the absolute core of our notions of fairness in the workplace. They represent a deliberate attempt to undermine the voices of workers. And they're really fundamentally anti-democratic. Uh, I have a few excerpts, excerpts from that letter um, that talks about in quotes, how to deal with, quote, our enemies, particularly the government union bosses, by replicating what Scott Walker did in Wisconsin and what, what was done in Michigan. And here's a quote from that letter. Now is the time to fight back like David of the Bible. Now is the time to come forward and slay Pennsylvania's big labor Goliath. The overriding key to our whole plan will be our ability to starve the giant. So starve the giant. That, that's what's behind the attacks we're seeing for example, in the state payroll deduction fight, which is brewing. Um, the Commonwealth, by the way, calls that in its fundraising letter the most important tactic that, that Scott Walker used in Wisconsin to go after the unions and that it, quote, succeeded beyond his wildest imagination in Wisconsin. So that's what this state is looking at, serious effort to try to um, undermine uh, public sector unions. And keep in mind what we're talking about here is, is the continu continuing ability of of public union members to voluntarily have their union dues deducted from their paychecks. Um, and and who, who are these members who we have to be so scared of? I mean, they're, they're our neighbors, they're all of us, right? They're firefighters and policemen and teachers and social workers and healthcare workers. And, and that's, that's who, who's, who's essentially choice, voluntary decision in the workplace is being undermined. Um, and, and again, it's because the, the unions that represent these workers are fighting for that share of, a fair share of that, of that, of the, of the wealth, a fair share, the opportunity to, to succeed, to really try to make a dent in this, this income inequality that is really plaguing our nation. So, um, and, and the, the, the notion that, that, that that this is happening, it's, 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 it, it, it's, it's a race to the bottom. It's eroding America's middle class. And it won't only harm American families and communities, it'll, it'll change the very nature of society and, and not for the better. So, 
So we've got money getting people elected, and people elected driving a set of policy agendas that serve the moneyed interests that got them elected um, happening at the state, local, and federal level. And it is this toxic kind of anti-democratic cycle that I believe disregards our core democratic values um, and erodes American public's ability to hold those in power accountable for working for the common good. And, and if that means if we don't act, if we don't pay attention to this, that Wisconsin could be coming to Pennsylvania. So that's, that's my story, but I didn't really come here to depress you. <laughs> so I, I want to end on an optimistic note, because I actually really am optimistic. I believe the American public understands what's going on, and people are getting angry. I mean, the polls show that Americans across ideology, across party um, identification, believe that corporations and the wealthy have too much power in this country. They get it. They get it in their gut. Um, and I think they're ready to fight back. I think they love our democracy, um, and they're ready to fight for it. I think there's three basic things that we need to do. Um, first, I think we really just need to understand the cycle. So that we need to understand that it's not by accident that folks in this room are in involved in the battles that you're involved in. Um, it, there's, there's an agenda there to undermine the interests of working families. And we, understand, we need to understand that we need to fix that, the, the threat to our democracy. We need to understand what's going on and we need to fix that. Um, and that if we're going to address the attack on, on working families, we need to address um, the agenda of fixing our democracy. Um, so fundamentally, we can't deal with the income inequality unless we understand that it's driven by the political inequality. We have to understand that that's the problem. Second, we need to expose this. We need to expose this to the light of day. We need to talk about the threat to our democracy and our democratic values. We need to show the, the links between our democracy problem and all the other issues we work on. Because if we do that, we broaden our coalitions and we are kind of in this together. Um, so we need to understand, for example, what's driving this attack on, on working families in Pennsylvania, on public employees in Pennsylvania. Um, and what is it that the other folks who are driving this agenda hope to achieve? We need to look in the faces of our neighbors who are under attack teachers and law enforcement officials and firefighters and, and, and social workers and, and, and understand that we have to make that our own fight too, that we really are in this together. So understand what's going on, expose it to the light of day. And then I think it's also important that we fight to take back our democracy. Interestingly, the, there are sort of pro-democracy organizations that have come together to expose what ALEC is doing, the American Legislative Exchange Council, and since that's been going on, 49 major corporations and 77 state legislators have pulled out of ALEC. So the exposure, the understanding the problem, the exposure can, can make a difference. Um, around the sort of money and politics arena, there's a whole huge, large number of organizations that are working for a whole range of remedies. One of them that we're particularly working on is, is working on amending the Constitution to undo what the court did. Um, and there's a number of organizations involved in that that have already succeeded in getting 16 res resolutions passed in 16 states and over 500 municipalities um, calling for overturning Citizens United. Um, New York State is poised to, to pass a small donor public financing bill. So are things that we can do, if we understand the problem, willing to expose to the light of day, understand that we're all in this together. Um, so I guess what I would leave you with is a, is a request that as you go about the very urgent work that each of you is doing, Remember the important work as well of um, fixing our democracy, that we're all in this together. And I do believe that together we really can create government that works for the people, not the privileged few. It's going to be hard, but I know that we can do it. And I just really appreciate the opportunity to, to, to share these thoughts with you. And thank you again for all of the work that, that you're doing every day. Thank you so much.